Hello and welcome back to Before the Shutter with me, Harley Bainbridge. For those who don't know the podcast, I'm a professional photographer and conceptual artist from Manchester in the UK. And this podcast is all about photographic theory, good books, good photographers, nice images, and more specifically, why they're nice images, why they're good photographers, but also the ideas and issues that surround photography and art in general about representation and identity. It all sounds like quite a convoluted mess, but essentially it boils down to me doing critical reviews of other people's work, some critical review of my own work, book reviews, and episodes like this, which is a little bit more off the cuff, as it wasn't necessarily planned this way, but as it's turned out this week, And finally, I've matched my uh, actual schedule of producing an episode one week after the last. For those who've been listening for a while will know that I normally say a week and sometimes it's two, sometimes it's four, but never mind. This episode is actually about resilience and maintaining your resilience as an artist who's publishing work, who's an early career artist so you don't have necessarily an agency or a gallery behind you or you don't have that um, professional confirmation of whether your work is good or bad or whatever it might be. So the reason why we're doing uh, a podcast about resilience this week is primarily because I've had one of those weeks which normally or previously would have been quite a detrimental week for my uh, personal mental health or ambition and confidence and my commitment to creating new work and and it's only through what I'm going to advise for you guys today that I've actually come out of the week feeling actually positive about it and being able to turn a few of those negatives around potentially make content from it which I suppose is one piece of advice straight off the bat now I'm not going to make you listen for the next 20 minutes as I ramble and wander around the topic and give my uh, off the chest kind of whinge so essentially my advice for building your resilience as an artist is to diversify and by diversify I don't mean that you need to create different mediums of work or more appealing work or change anything necessarily about your practice but to diversify where you get feedback and support from so Initially, I started out, much as anyone, producing work and putting it onto Instagram. And just as everyone else has probably experienced, getting your work seen on Instagram is extremely difficult outside of your circle of friends or your peers. And that's something we've known for a while because at the end of the day, Instagram is a business and they are trying to monetize. And they do that by selling advertisements. And essentially what they're asking you to do by limiting your reach and your your discoverability is to encourage you to buy advertisements to reach audience that you don't normally do through your normal techniques yes there is the use of hashtags and yes you can go out there and build an audience by engaging with every single account that you come across and essentially baiting them into following you and you following them but i'm a big proponent of building your own audience and through building your own audience you achieve a much higher level of engagement and that level of engagement is a lot better for you personally because you're going to get better uh, results from when you publish work it's going to be more likely to be seen because you've got a high level of engagement but also the people who are engaging with your work are more likely to give you feedback or support um, and advice on how to improve or how to monetize or how to um, develop your practice in in other ways and that's why I publish my work I'm, I'm not publishing it to get a pat on the back I'm publishing it to seek that feedback to improve and that's something that you don't get when you're in click groups or whatever they call them pods where everyone basically just I call it a circle jerk it's just everyone basically liking everyone's stuff to try and beat the algorithm now I told you this is going to be 
a bit of a ranty warble tangent based podcast today let's get back to the topic at hand and that is how do you build your resilience so whilst we're on the topic of instagram the first experience that i've had this week is i published some work from several months ago which i never really felt um, confident in it was something that i did as an idea as an experiment and when i was looking at the images i, I just felt they were lacking something i, I wasn't 100 percent certain what it was but i'd achieved what i'd set out to do i just felt maybe my idea wasn't that good that sense was turned around by a meeting that i had with uh, several academics it was part of uh, a development thing that i was doing for myself and that development thing was about assessing your own work about judging when it was ready to be seen or shared and that session was run by an academic who i have a lot of respect for a lot of appreciation for their time because they are very busy they are popular they are exhibiting worldwide and and their work is very performative very subversive there's a lot that i see in their work which i share ideas for for my own essentially i asked the question how do you balance the performative work with the academic life you've got to have this duality and the response was you just don't essentially her advice was you do the work and then you justify the work and it's in justifying the work that you create that separation so in itself that was a really good piece of advice and it's something that i've taken on and i'm going to be thinking about a lot over the next however long it goes on for but it wasn't just the advice it was the fact that through that conversation we built some kind of connection and i was able to engage with that person on social media and despite them being light years ahead of me in their career they've decided to start supporting me a little bit through social media and it was seeing that unprompted support it wasn't that a case of i went out and i was begging for someone to follow me it was a case of we could see a a bit of a parallel in our work then that also did give me a little bit of a sense of trepidation about what i publish next because the expectation now is different it's not an audience that i've built through um, general social media it is an audience which could potentially influence my future career and going back to the work that i created it was that piece of work that i was unsure about which i decided to share and just essentially built the context of that series of images around the advice that that person had given and that's when i decided to change my point of view from this is a piece of work which should be published it should be recognized and I just accepted the fact that this image is actually an experiment. It's um, it's a presentation on my thoughts around certain academic issues regarding photography. So I published it anyway. It had been probably a week since I published anything because I've been really struggling to create recently. And that struggling to create is part of the resilience. I'd gone through a long period of feeling that no matter what I produced, how I produced it, where I posted it and how I promoted it, it just wasn't gaining traction. I was starting to feel the weight of the algorithm, as it were, on my personal confidence. So having that break from publishing anything gave me a chance to reset my expectations around how it should succeed. In a way, distancing myself from um, the platform of Instagram allowed me to think well it's fine if it doesn't do too well because i've been away for a while so potentially the algorithm's not going to favor any of my work and i'm just going to have to start building it back up again however this what i thought was average work ended up being probably my second or third most popular post this year Uh, it's in the top 10 for the last two years to be honest and i think It was having the confidence to put out something which is more personal, more expose, 
but also tailoring that context around the academic which helped it succeed so much it was no longer i'm just putting this out there because it's something i've created but here is an in-depth and detailed story that goes with that work to justify and explain and reference something that you can not only enjoy as an image but you can learn from and you can go and research other practitioners and that success does definitely build a lot of confidence but I recognize that for probably two or three weeks prior to that success I was on a bit of a personal downward spiral and that's what prompted obviously us talking about resilience today so how did I maintain resilience over them couple of weeks well as I said right at the beginning of the podcast I decided that it was time for me to start diversifying and and by diversifying I don't necessarily mean changing my practice as I mentioned before what I started to do was seek out other outlets so it had been a long time since I'd used 500px and Flickr and Reddit and I hadn't been consistent with my podcast and my blog writing so I took that time to update all those profiles and took the time to start creating more frequently and in some kind of routine for the podcast and for blogs it was moving away from doing photography for a while to concentrate on pushing that photography into different channels that i started to realize that that one social media channel is not the be all and end all of my success as an artist or a photographer but that actually it's just one of many different channels where I can get inspiration, where I can get validation, I can get engagement from. So part of the process of me maintaining that resilience is that I started posting to uh, Reddit more often. One of the best things that I've found about Reddit is that there is a lot less focus on uh, consistent posting behaviour or the successes and failures of singular images there's a lot less focus on self-promotion it's not there for you to like bomb or follow bomb or link bomb the site it's very much frowned upon if you are there just to promote yourself and it's really good because it also fulfills my um, desires as being able to educate and teach and instruct there's a lot of artists a lot of photographers who use reddit to ask fairly basic questions which a google search can generally answer for you but they feel a lot more confident in being able to discuss it with someone and i really enjoy that because i am a technically minded person i enjoy technology i enjoy the process of taking photographs as well as the actual theory and the critical and academic discussions surrounding the medium and by using that part of my brain for a few days rather than focusing purely on whether this instagram post is going to do well or not it actually gave me a really good sense of satisfaction that maybe i've helped someone make a decision somewhere or improve their own practice in some way and that again is part of that resilience building where you're not relying directly on the success of a post but you're getting some confidence from the appreciation of someone who may not have access to the same resources or peer group or support that you do you can be that support for someone else and in doing so you get a great deal of appreciation back which bolsters your own resilience as well i understand that a lot of the social media pods are supposed to be about that self-resilience but the great thing about doing it through something like Reddit or through podcasting is there is no real ulterior motive to doing it. By upvoting or answering or sharing things through mediums that aren't Facebook and Instagram, you're not ticking the boxes of an algorithm. It's predominantly based on whether your audience feels that you are worthy of sharing or that your answers are timely and interesting and, and relevant and valid yes you need to get up votes to get seen but it's a lot less focused on monetizing the poster and much more focused on creating actual useful and valid content 
And to emphasize that, I posted a series of images for the first time on Reddit. After spending some time getting to know the rules and speaking to a few people and establishing a little bit of rapport within certain subreddits. And that one set of images from last year during lockdown, which did okay on Instagram and did okay on other social media platforms, probably four or five percent engagement where normally I'm around two to three and my best work is between eight and ten percent on something like Instagram. This first post on Reddit immediately shot to well 200 upvotes and maybe a dozen awards and that was really shocking to me that something that's created as artwork and shared in a subreddit not based on art not based on photography but actually based on the locale could have such a quick and impressive reaction with that audience something i'd never experienced on instagram and that's where i really started to think about how much of a difference that makes to my resilience that one post seemed to immediately confirm that there is actually an audience out there for my work and that my work isn't a complete waste of time and yes, as soon as it does well on Reddit, it disappears again. But I like that about it. I like the fact that it will do well if it deserves to do well. But if you've created something which isn't your best work, it's going to disappear quite quickly and not be noticed by people. Whereas when you have it on a platform what presents all your work as a flat portfolio, it's always going to exist on that platform. And if you've created something which isn't your best work, you then have to start thinking about how you're going to curate that particular platform so that it's always doing the best that it can. And I'm not here to be a social media manager. I'm not here to curate for Instagram. I'm here to create work and I'm here to educate and I'm here to inform. And it's that desire to develop my work and my practice beyond just the images that I produce that is the reason why I do the podcast. Yes, I will promote my website and yes, I'll promote my social media as part of it. But that's because I feel that the podcast ties into my work and that my work ties back into the podcast. So not only can you use the podcast to learn more about other people's work and the way they work and the medium as a whole, but by viewing the images alongside the podcast, not only will you hear about it, you'll be able to inspect and decide for yourself about my interpretations and my readings and my decisions about whether images are good or they have issues or not. So that brings me on to my section where I have a little bit of a whinge. And I did this entire podcast yesterday and just decided the whole thing was just pretty much a complete whinge. So I deleted it and I'm re-recording it now that the... Uh, dust has settled a little bit but my little whinge is about how if you are focused completely on one specific social media channel or outlet there's a lot of people out there who will want to either bring you down or ride on your success and that can be really disheartening when you don't seem to be doing as well audience wise or engagement wise as someone who goes out of their way to to try and sully your own work. So why is it that I bring that up? Well, the first one was the post that I put on Instagram, which actually turned out to be one of the best ones that I ever did, is one which garnered a lot of commentary, a lot of discussion around the themes of the images and the influences of the images. Now that's fantastic. I love the peer reviews. I love being able to discuss further that these ideas and recommend people to read certain books or to investigate certain practitioners but the frustrating thing was one of my peers who is in a very similar position to me in terms of the development of their career decided that the best way to engage with the work was to basically insert one of their own images into the comments in a way to distract or deflect the conversation to something else now the funny thing is it didn't work because instagram doesn't accept hyperlinks in the way that that person posted and if they wanted me to review some of their work that's fine i have no problem with that 
generally when people want to do that and when I want to do that, I'll generally DM someone and say, hey, do you mind having a look at my work and seeing what uh, works about it, what doesn't work about it? But to try and insert that into the conversation around a post which is clearly gaining traction is a common thing to happen on Instagram. And as an artist, it's really frustrating because to get some traction on Instagram is difficult. It's a very competitive environment. The environment is set up in a way which you design not to succeed without investing money or unless you are someone who can garner interest and garner money through your already fame. And my peer obviously realized what they had done when I pointed out that the link didn't work. And his response was, well, I suppose it serves me right for trying to hijack someone else's thread. If this had happened maybe a couple of weeks ago when I wasn't really in the same frame of mind, I feel like I probably would have gone off at that person a little bit, maybe in DM, so it weren't public, but I also probably would have posted yesterday's podcast where when I recorded it yesterday, I was a little bit salty about the whole experience, but essentially I see it as confirmation that the post is doing well. If someone else can see that it's getting lots of comments and likes and it's gaining that traction and they decide that they want to try and ride along that, it's a bit of a confirmation, but it is very, very frustrating. And I feel a bit personally aggravated by that because it is someone that I know, it's someone that I work with and it's someone who is in a very similar position to me and I feel that they've got themselves into one of these engagement pods and their advice has been go on people's posts, see if it's doing well and if it's doing well make sure you're advertising your own work. That's fine, I completely understand. Everyone wants to be seen, everyone wants to build an audience but I also feel that it's a pretty underhand tactic to use especially with a contemporary. If you want to go onto someone's post and do it and they are specifically asking for that kind of thing and they are encouraging that kind of interaction, they've got a bigger audience than you and they are looking to promote you, that's fine, that's fantastic. But to go standing on the toes of people in similar positions of you does leave a bad taste in the mouth. So my advice for things like that is whilst i'm not some big artist i'm not some big creator in the future there is a potential that i could be and in previous careers when i worked in retail and fashion and charity where i was able to invest money into artists i was able to recruit people i was able to purchase equipment and supplies and when you're in that position these kind of interactions influence who you um, do business with and If I felt as a business owner at that time that a particular person was trying to ride on the back of our name or our success, when it came to the time of making a decision over whether I would choose them or someone who worked with us without expectation, it'd be the person without expectation that I'd go to because I could rely on them more to consider the business's perspective over their own. So the point is, I guess, is find validation through your own work. If all you're going to do is somehow have this circle jerk mentality of everyone likes everyone's thing, you're never truly going to get good feedback or relevant feedback. And if you do, you're always gonna have in the back of your mind that that feedback has come through because it's part of the circle jerk and not actually a genuine critique. The second story I have for you is from LinkedIn. Now, LinkedIn is something that I use to communicate with businesses about providing commercial services, things like portraits, headshots, PR branding events, the general photography kind of jobs that people get, where it's not necessarily about the art, but a lot of it is about who you know, not what you know. The reason why I'm telling this story is, it's an example really of know your audience. I am still in the process of discovering my audience and finding out about what they like, what to talk about, what images to show, what platforms work best, times of day, all that kind of stuff. I'm very much in a in a process of discovery. Whereas on LinkedIn, I'm a lot more familiar with who my clients are. 
mainly because I've worked in business previously so I have an idea of what they want to see and how they want to see it. Still got a lot of work to do there to really build up the financial side of the business but essentially anyone who I approach I do my due diligence on. So this second story is based basically on a photographer who approached me, who connected with me on LinkedIn and their approach was to try and recruit me as a client and they wanted me as a client because they had transitioned their photography business into providing business mentoring and that's fine some people will benefit from that business mentoring aspect they need the hand holding or direction that someone with a lot of experience can give however and this is kind of ironic that i'm talking about this during a educational podcast as it were some photographers who are now in the business of education are in the business of education because they're trying to monetize their follower base or a skill set or recognition in the field in a way which to me kind of reflects on the fact that they can't be making that much money doing actual photography if they need to spend their entire time trying to sell mentoring now i'm going to insert a disclaimer here just because you do mentoring as your primary income does not mean that you're a bad photographer but i always ask the question why is it that they are mentoring instead of being a photographer so to look at this individual's profile and to delve into their social media their basis for the mentoring service is that they have a significant following on instagram of all places as expected it was around 14,000 but the issue was with the large audience associated with this particular person is that their engagement levels were actually really really low for 14,000 followers and to be only getting one or two hundred engagements with each post is showing that that is a very very low engagement level and essentially when you've got an engagement level that low it raises red flags because how are they getting such a big audience if their engagement is so low is it a follower base which has been paid for through some kind of farming technique is it an audience who genuinely have forgotten that they even follow this person or they have no interest in that person is it an audience which is reflective of their skill or talent or business skills of that photographer that's not to say that a low engagement level is necessarily indicative of the success of the photographer you can look at some photographers and they might only have one or two hundred likes or comments per post but you can also generally see that the audience level is indicative of a good percentage of engagement so they may only have five or six thousand followers with that kind of engagement not 14 or 15 thousand what you'll tend to find as well is typically the type of photographer who is selling these mentoring classes is generally someone who has found success in a niche kind of way or a very specific algorithm pleasing kind of way and by that i mean it's quite clickbaity imagery it's short shelf it's an instant gratification type of imagery which appeals to a certain demographic of person now that certain demographic of person isn't necessarily interested in photography they might not be interested in art they might not be interested in theory they might and probably most likely not interested in actually hiring you as a photographer to do any creative the reason why they're typically engaging with that type of photographer is because that photographer produces lifestyle images of a aspirational type and this particular photographer who had approached me on LinkedIn was exactly that type of photographer. They'd spent two years living in Bali. So every photo was a beautiful sunset, a beautiful beach. It helped that the photographer themselves was a young, attractive Scandinavian woman. And that's not to say that she couldn't be a good photographer. It's not to say that Bali isn't a good subject, but in a social media world when you combine them three the vast majority of the audience is not interested in the photography not interested in hiring or learning from that person 
what they're interested in is living that lifestyle so they're actually selling a brand which is designed to attract influencers it's designed to attract sponsorships and product placements it's not designed as an artistic outlet or a service that a business would hire to create something unique and brand defining for themselves it's purely an outlet for clickbait essentially that's really reflected in the way that that person approached me as a potential client essentially it was i did this that and the other if you're interested in being mentored by me send me a message and we'll get talking there were no reference to my personal work my personal history my own successes i politely just said not for me thank you very much and moved on but the reason why i bring it up is in terms of resilience if you are approached by a person such as that and you go in and do a little bit of research but only on the surface level you might be thinking they've got a large social media following they're doing mentoring they're not really commenting on any of my work but why is it that they've got that and i haven't and when i looked at it i'm like how has this person got 14,000 people following them on an instagram when essentially what they're doing is selling a mentoring service they're not actually doing a photography service it's only when i took their social media following with a pinch of salt and looked at it from a very cynical point of view i don't, I don't like to be cynical i don't mind being critical but cynical it's not really my thing but it's my only explanation for it so the reason why i bring that up is i don't want people to feel disheartened when they see clickbaity work which is reaching a lot of people apparently do a little bit more digging into that person if someone's trying to sell you a mentoring program or they're trying to give you advice and critique always do just a little bit of due diligence if you scratch beneath the surface you'll generally find that there's a reason why they're not making money as a photographer you'll generally find that their audience is not that engaged in their actual work and especially when you start reading into their content the content what they create as a mentor is generally very generic it's things that they've read on other mentors pages it's things they've read on google searches it's very impersonal with very little reference to actually how they've done things or how they've achieved things and i suppose really that's a good point for me to bring up my own work i'm doing this podcast as part of my personal development it's helping me with my academic studies it's helping me with ideas for the future it's helping me learn how to speak about these topics and themes and ideas the work that i've produced as a photographer is primarily from my own personal interest it gets put out there on social media and it gets put out there for my studies I'm quite lucky that through my website and social media and through my podcast, you can see that, or hear rather, that my work is not hanging in national galleries. It's not selling for millions of dollars at Sotheby's latest auction, but it is there being commissioned by studios for their portrait work. It's there being commissioned by businesses for their event work. And if you have a dig in my website, you'll see and it is there being selected for publication. It's only small wins, but the small wins that I'm lucky to have had, and a lot of people have not yet had that opportunity. So when I've read books or I've spoken to people about how they broke through or how they made money, the answers are generally very, very uh, generic. It's very much, it's who you know, not what you know. And I know that I've been very frustrated by that feeling of that's not very tangible. It's not very to-do list. And it isn't very to-do list. A lot of these things aren't very tangible, but there's a lot of tangible things that you can do to help support your development. And the two that we've talked about so far are cultivate your own audience. Make sure that the people who are engaging with your work are interested in it and they're feeding back on it and they're connecting with it 
don't go chasing the follower number because that ends up leading you down into uh, circle jerk like groups where you'll never get good feedback you'll never get academic critique you'll never stand out from the crowd because you'll end up creating work which appeases those in your peer group the other is if anyone approaches you to give advice or mentoring do some due diligence and just see why is it that they're offering mentoring instead of actually being in the art world themselves and dig into the social media clout to see whether the people that follow them are engaging with their work or that work is actually something more than just being a collection of images that are geared towards influencer marketing. So now we've kind of covered the problem with circle jerking and the problem with people who are mentors. So I have two more stories for you. One of them is about funding, which is an experience that I had yesterday when I was hoping to find out some information about how I can fund some ongoing and future projects. And the second one is about trolling. So when it comes to funding, there is, in the UK at least, lots of organisations, including local authorities, the government, museums, galleries, who produce funding for uh, creative work. Now I'm in the process really of getting my head around who funds for what, how to apply for it. Um, I have like a meeting next week with someone who does bids and tenders who's going to help me learn more about how to write that kind of thing. But yesterday I was on a meeting for uh, funding advisors and it was an hour and 10 minutes long online. It was an awful experience because of the technical limitations that they apparently had. But right at the end, they did a QA. and a And my question was, I struggle to find my place in the creative arts world because I'm a documentary and conceptual art photographer, which never seems to be clearly defined within the requirements for funding. What advice would you give to an early career artist who's looking to do a social enterprise project? I thought, that would be a fairly straightforward question to answer. There was five people, all from different funding bodies, all from different roles. But it was essentially met with silence. And that silence really it was a little bit disheartening because I'd spent an hour and 10 minutes making loads of notes, thinking, oh, that's good advice. This is good advice. I'm going to look into that. I'm going to look into this. But yet, when it comes to asking the specific question about my field of work, I was essentially met with, well, photography kind of falls into film and that's not really in the creative arts for us. And maybe you should think about talking to people to commission some work. And what had been an hour and 10 minutes discussion basically about writing and music, live performance, etc. It turned into a bit of a sense of a waste of time. And as I've mentioned earlier in the podcast, that would have been a bit of a disheartening experience for me a couple of weeks ago because I'd set up all these meetings for learning about funding and learning about bids and tenders and thinking about how I could develop an idea for a project and the beginnings of a business plan, etc. And it, in one fell swoop, it felt as if I was being told by these leaders within the funding agency that photography is not considered part of the arts in England. While normally being told that by experts in the field, it's very easy to take that as gospel, that it is true that photography doesn't fall within the arts or that there's no funding available for photography. But immediately after the meeting, I started Googling the businesses that these people work for, the people themselves, the kind of funding that they offered and how that funding fit in with photography. And I'm seeing collections of work by photographers. I'm seeing funding pots that I'd never heard of before for photography specifically. And essentially what I'm saying is it left me with the sense that these particular people, not that they didn't know what they were talking about, 
but that the entire premise of that particular meeting was built around music. It wasn't outlined in the meeting notes, it wasn't outlined in the title or the discussion, but there was a distinct lack of knowledge around other types of art, other mediums. So my advice and the point of telling that story is, if you go to a, one of these types of meetings or you speak to one of these types of people who work in education or they work in funding or they work in a gallery and they have no knowledge or they dismiss your idea, that is not to mean that it's not valid. We're coming out of what has been one of the most, one of the most complex and difficult periods of history and no one really knows how the world is going to be once we get back to the new normal. There's been a vast increase in the use of streaming technology, video technology, gaming, VR, AR. There's lots of technologies that are being used in new ways by a lot more people. So what was once considered an avenue for purely the visual arts where that wouldn't necessarily generate funding because it wasn't considered either engaging enough or outreach enough is now actually the primary way of getting an audience and informing and educating people so those who are still in the old way of doing things are having to relearn their jobs they're having to move away from this is a physically based medium this is a physical location we're going to have to start thinking more about digital based locations and mediums we're going to have to think more about how that medium doesn't just do x y it also does z and actually this medium is now the controlling medium one of the things about performative work especially and i've done a few intervention pieces of work where the actual work itself was sculpture or performance but because of the nature of the artwork it's through the medium of photography that i communicate that idea so you might not have been there to see that performance you might not have been there to see that sculpture one of the pieces that i installed into a city center actually got torn down within 30 or 40 minutes and that was fantastic because by communicating it through the medium of photography i were actually able to not only capture the installation of it but i was also capturing the interaction with and then the removal of so the work is actually a photographic work but it was through the use of sculpture that i was able to create that work and a lot of the old school funders haven't got their head around what that actually means for for them and how they're going to utilize that and how they're going to support it so so again, if you come up against these barriers to funding or to engagement or to recognition, rather than take it as a hit to a confidence or a hit to your idea or an indication that maybe you're going in the wrong direction, think of it as a challenge to overcome. Yes, these particular groups, these particular individuals don't want to fund that. That's fine. But by finding out more about who works in your particular field you'll no doubt come across those who do want to fund it who do want to exhibit it and who do want to publish it oh okay so that brings us on to the last story of this particular podcast and this one is about critique and hypocrisy so throughout the podcast i like to think that i've been saying seek out your peers seek out feedback critique diversify your channels and it's through that diversification that I started sharing work in new places so that I didn't get trapped into the lack of engagement on one particular social media channel, but using a multitude of different platforms to cross migrate my work, but also where one might not be performing very well, another one might prove that actually it's the platform, not the work. That being said, when you do diversify your platforms, you're inviting a lot more attention to your work, you're inviting a lot more critique to the work. And that can be really, really good, especially if you can tap into getting feedback from people who you respect or admire, but it also opens you up to trolling. And 
The example of trolling that I want to talk about is that I wrote a blog post earlier this week called Photography is Easy. To shorten it, it's actually longer, but but I'm going to try and keep this episode under an hour, so I'm not going to go into it too much. But essentially, the article opens with the statement that photography is easy, that we no longer need to know all the skills to do with chemical processing and film stock and lighting in the same way that we used to when it was analog but how digital now means that when we look at the viewfinder or the screen it shows us exactly what we're going to get when we click the shutter give or take for flash etc but essentially the technological knowledge has been removed from the process i personally think that's a really good thing because it gives a lot more accessibility. You don't need to spend a fortune on film and on processing and all the things that used to hold people back are now now a lot less influential on whether someone can create or whether they succeed at creating. But the conclusion of the essay was that photography isn't easy. Yes, the process of taking pictures is significantly more cost-effective, more accessible, but the actual creation of a good artistic image it still relies on the creator's visual intent their imagination their ability to create that visual image from their mind in front of the camera their knowledge of the field their knowledge of the subject their ability to communicate something through visual means it's still a very difficult art form it is just that everyone now thinks it's easy because because they can just take a photograph with the phone and it's relatively good quality the difficulty is in the contextualization the academic knowledge the experience of doing it time in and time out the reliability of being able to complete it when you need to complete it however one thing about trolling is that whenever you create something whether it is photographic work a podcast or an essay there are going to be people who disagree with your point of view don't like your work potentially don't like you and quite often won't like the fact that maybe you get some attention with your work whilst they are struggling to get attention with their own this particular individual decided that halfway through reading my essay that they'd read enough and didn't agree which is fine but they'd only got to the point about photography being easy and actually missed the point of the essay which was the conclusion Irregardless of that, because of their temperament, because of their frame of mind at that moment, their response to the essay was not to critique the points that were raised in the essay, but instead to go to my website on a mobile phone, take a screenshot of a particular image which had been cropped due to the fact it was on a mobile screen and not on a desktop, and declare that photography isn't easy, as you can see in your photos. Now, in the context of this particular discussion, I were a bit peeved at this because the way that the discussion was happening was that no one could actually see the photograph that he'd selected unless they clicked through on a link. Now, we all know that the vast majority of people don't click through links. They just read the headline and then they move on. And this is part of the problem with this person who was deciding to troll me that day. So in response to that particular post, I just laughed about it and said, well, I never declared myself to be a web designer. And the reason why I was able to do that and disassociate myself with any kind of actual conflicting argument with that individual was, I know that that image is good. And I know that it's good because it was commissioned by a portrait studio who then went on to sell that for a significant amount of money. And through my web design process, I've had multiple points of feedback i've had social media advisors i've I've had website designers i've had the clients themselves the studio who commissioned it i've had peers and contemporaries all point out how engaging of a photograph that is yes when taken out of context and presented on a mobile screen it does crop down to present a funny arrangement of arms but looking at that image if you concentrate on the arms you are ignoring the other seven eighths of the image which is a person's face their smile their glowing eyes the composition the tonal structure so the point is 
not to blow smoke at my own arse, which it probably sounds like a little bit, but if you publish things out there and maybe you want to get one or two responses and then one or two responses are trolling, it's most likely because that individual has taken offense at your success or your point of view. And rather than critiquing in a helpful and constructive manner, they default to a negative attack. And it's like the only way that they know how to communicate their feelings over a certain thing is to try and undermine you as an individual. In some ways, I have seriously considered in retaliating because this individual is producing very low volume of work. So it's very easy to go through their entire catalog. What they do produce is very public. Their comments are available on one side and their photographs on the other. And this particular individual has gone out of their way to comment on some posts. I stepped away from fashion photography because I found it extremely vapid. Whereas the very next post on the feed is a photograph of what I consider probably one of the most misogynistic images I've ever seen in my entire life. And that is the image of a female form on a bed which in itself can be problematic, but they're in a position which can be perceived as a very sexually violent position. They are exposing themselves in a very uncomfortable way. They are abstracted from their personality and agency. We don't see any kind of connection with the camera or the photographer. We just see this prostrate and vulnerable individual, which in certain contexts could be considered a relevant image but as presented is very much a power dynamic between the photographer and the subject which i could very easily go out and publicly state you consider fashion photography vapid but you are creating misogynistic work and i've decided that's something i'm not going to do because essentially what i will be doing to that individual is what they attempted to do to me and my work and their attempt just kind of fell flat because I didn't rise to that occasion I just laughed it off and moved on and and essentially when I'm advising people about being resilient I don't feel that it is very fair to then go and try and attack someone's resilience or cause them to shut down to the idea of further development of their own practice by essentially being a troll myself and trying to destroy that resilience. I'd much rather come onto here and discuss it and point out why I had an issue with it and point out how if you're relying on that single point of confirmation for your work, it's always essentially going to be undermined. And that pretty much brings us to the conclusion of the podcast. Finally, it's probably going to be about 40 minutes or 45 minutes this is a long one again but the conclusion is there are going to be times when you feel that your work is not being engaged with it's not reaching new people that when it is it's not actually getting positive feedback or positive reaction there's going to be times when people tell you that it can't be done or we're not going to fund it and there's going to be times when people outright try to undermine your work and critique and chastise you and attack you as an individual for something that you've created and unfortunately that is par for the course it's something that you have to learn to deal with it's something that you have to turn around but my advice for being resilient against it is diversify where you show your work show it to your friends your family your peers show it on instagram show it on reddit show it on twitter show it on podcasts show it on wordpress show it on imago show it on pinterest every single platform that you've got an opportunity to share your work on do it and it's a lot of work or at least it seems like a lot of work and it's something that i've been building up over time finding the right places but trust me when one isn't doing so well the other might be doing excellently when one is creating a troll the other is creating admirer and it's that combination of having multiple points of view about your work which will help you be more resilient. Also, if it's unanimously good across them platforms, you can get a massive confidence boost because you know that it's 
you know that wherever you're showing that work it is succeeding it is being recognized if it's not succeeding across the entire range of things don't take it as a sign that you are bad or your work is bad but take it as a learning opportunity to discover what you could have done better ideally i would suggest lean more towards the platforms where your underperforming work doesn't hang around for as long as your good performing work that's one of the good things about something like reddit and twitter people would have to go out of the way to discover everything that you've ever published there and it's that going out of the way which means that if something doesn't do so well it's fine most people will never see it and most people will never remember it but when something does do well it's going to have a much bigger audience and a much easier time gaining traction and that is kind of uh, it i suppose post everywhere create do what you want to do ignore everyone and don't rise to it thanks so i will try and get a podcast out for next week but if i keep doing this thing where i record the podcast and delete it because i'm having a bit of a rant then it might be a little bit later but it might be a little bit earlier you never know i want to say thank you very much to everyone who's been listening it's been really good i've had quite a few new listeners this week and that's been leading to quite a few new people visiting my website and my blog which is fantastic thank you so much if you do want to check out my work if you go to harleybainbridge.com there's links on there to everything if you've got any questions comments feedback i'm always open to it especially on the podcast because it is still so new to me i never know whether it sounds good i never know whether the structure is fantastic but if you want to drop me an email or a message, you can find me again, harleybainbridge.com. Everything's on there. If you enjoy it, please subscribe. I'd like to see or hear or pretend I can see and hear uh, as many people each week. And that way we build up the series and you get to learn step by step by step. And as you can probably hear, my voice is starting to go now because I've been recording for an hour and 16 I'll probably have to cut like 20 minutes of that out. Thank you very much. Have a lovely week. See you soon.